my amazing viewers. Thank you so much for joining me on my program once again. I appreciate you wherever you are connecting from. If you have not subscribed to my channel, please kindly subscribe to my channel. Click the notification bell so that you be notified each time I upload a video. You will be among the first to receive it. Thank you so much and remain blessed. Kingsley Moralo served as Deputy Governor of CBN 2009 to 2014. Before then, he was founder and CEO of Sugato Strategics SA, Global Strategy and Risk Management Consultancy Firm in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, member of Advisory Council of the Official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum, and currently the president of the Institute for Governance and Economic Transformation. Thank you so much for coming over. Thank you. Thank you, Amici. Now, across the world, I said at the beginning of the program, we've, we've seen countries face a huge economic challenges. Venezuela, inflation, debt rising, and all that. We've also seen countries uh, um, struggle with security challenges. Afghanistan, Somalia, yet to come out of it. But it appears in Nigeria we're having the convergence of this. Too. Yes. And the question is, can we handle it? Can we navigate out of these two pronged uh, threats? Well, I would say that uh, I want to be very honest. Um, I'm a Nigerian and I'm a patriotic citizen. And I certainly hope and pray that we uh, make our way successfully through these challenges. But if I am to be factual, you know, to look at what I'm seeing, you know, as against what I'm hoping, mm. it doesn't look good. Maybe we'll start from what you're seeing. Well, what am I seeing? Mm. I'm seeing a gradual collapse of the Nigerian state in the face of terrorist attacks. You know, very well coordinated, very well planned terrorist attacks. But for me, the reason I feel sad is not so much the attacks themselves, because terrorists attack various nations, but the apparent inability of Nigeria's security forces to protect our lives. And even going beyond that, what seems to be like collusion between terrorist forces and perhaps some individuals in the security networks? How could Kujay have Kujay prison? They attacked for three hours and there is no response. Does that look normal to you? So, therefore, what I'm trying to say is that we're in a really very dire situation and we may come to a point where it's just chaos. Every man for himself. People have to protect themselves uh, against terrorist attacks. And when that happens, you know that the state has collapsed, essentially. The state has continued to reassure citizens. Uh, National Security Council meeting held on Thursday. Uh, they said, no need to panic. We're on top of the situation. We need your support. We need sure. the support of every citizen. We should give uh, them new strategies are being employed. And uh, before you know it, the momentum will be against the terrorists. We hope so. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we certainly hope so. We will support our uh, leaders and our security forces. Um, but we have to see the reality of the new strategy and how effective it is. You see? So that's the point. Um, we've, we've had these assurances for several years now. The problem keeps getting worse. My measurement of the seriousness of the Nigerian state, for me, is that they must turn this into an offensive war against the terrorists. You take the battle to the enemy. You take them out. You don't wait for them to strike and you're fighting defensive battles. That's a wrong strategy completely. If you're only defending yourself against terrorists, you're not fighting terrorism. You fight terrorism by going to where you know the terrorists are. They have the intelligence. Is there some lack of political will? Mm. Is it a lack of equipment after all the billions of dollars that have been spent? So what exactly is it that makes it impossible for the government to really go into these forests where terrorists are said to be uh, grouped and grouping and bomb them or, or, or let the army, ground army troops, take control of those territories. This is the only thing that will change the dynamic of this situation. Any other thing that involves your, your defending yourself is not, in my view, a winning strategy. Let's look at the economic realities. Sure. 
Mm. What are you seeing also on that? Again, we have an economic meltdown. Um, inflation is, is very high. I would believe higher than the official figures, quite frankly. Higher than over 18%? I believe Why so. are you saying this? Because the way inflation is calculated, you know, the, uh, the, the, the commodity price index, I think, needs to change and take into consideration sort of new realities. 50% when I was at the central bank, a lot in the past, 50% of that index was based on the price of food. But there are also other factors that, that you know, are a way of reflecting the, the state of inflation, you know? Um, and I'm not sure if the weight of those factors is what it should be. So this is what I mean. Now you go beyond inflation, you look but at... But I was saying it with yeah. inflation. I, I see the MBS shows the... Uh, food inflation and consumer price index different from the normal inflation and it's always higher. Well, yes, that's mm -hmm. what I'm saying, mm -hmm. that there is a lot of emphasis mm -hmm. on the price of food and that's an important measurement. But there are other factors mm -hmm. that are also involved in inflation which focusing a lot on the price of food it may not capture everything. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying, you know, the food inflation is very important and that's why there's a separate food inflation index. But the overall uh, CPI is weighted yeah. almost 50%, if not 50%, based on the price of food. Currently? I believe so. Mm. I don't believe it has changed. Mm. I, I hope I'm not out of date, but mm. certainly when I was at the Central Bank, yeah. this is the way it was calculated. So, now, then you have unemployment at about 40%. <laughs> then you have the Naira crashing to over 700 Naira to, to the dollar you know, in the parallel market. And some people may say, oh, the official rate is this or that. But the fact that there's such a wide gap between the official rate and the parallel market tells you there's a fundamental problem. Again, when I was a deputy governor at the central bank, we were watching the parallel market very carefully mm -hmm. and we tried to make sure that the gap between the official rate and the parallel market wasn't huge. There was a time it was yeah. just about two naira difference? Yes, we were able to do that. You know, so, so and the, there are so many foundational problems in the management of the Nigerian economy and we are very again very reactive one of the reasons Nigeria's economy is tanking is because Nigeria's political processes are very weak very corrupt self-serving for politicians it's rent seeking our um, our natural resources are rents that the politicians collect and distribute to cronies based on patronage arrangements. When you rely only on oil for 80% of your forex or 90% of your forex, you are bound to be in this problem. Every natural resource dependent state faces this type of problem. It is impossible for such an economy to actually develop. So the problem is we talk a lot about diversification of the economy, but it has hasn't happened. And one of the reasons, more like a rhetoric. It's just rhetoric. Yeah. One of the reasons it hasn't happened is because the vested interests that the interests that are focused on the oil rents, you know, they're very powerful. And so they're not going to allow a situation where what happens now is no longer happening. So if we have a political leadership that is able to tame or control the vested interests and many of those vested interests, some are politicians, some are also yeah. in the private sector. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so it's a political economy, not just the pure economy mm -hmm. that, that Nigeria has a problem with. We the, the interface between politics, politics and, and economics, the interface, mm -hmm. and that is where we are not able to get it right. And so, the, the political leadership that we elect in this country is very important for what kind of economy you get in Nigeria. Because if you don't have leadership with the knowledge, with the experience preferably, with the political will, and with the understanding of what should be done about the Nigerian economy, then you will never get the right kind of economy. You may say, elect just the usual politician, dancing, uh, singing, making promises, let him appoint or her appoint capable people. It doesn't work. It is about the political leadership itself, ultimately. That political leadership must be visionary. That political leadership must be knowledgeable. That political leadership must be competent and have the political will. That's the point Nigerians are missing. Meanwhile, Nigerians worship politicians. 
but and then turn around to complain about the economy. Mm. And I find that perhaps the politicians themselves at some point uh, of course, begin to blame them. The themselves. politicians, exactly. Mm. But we are all dancing around the problem. That's the point. Well, why, why this sudden devaluation of the Naira, weakening of the Naira rather, at the power market, from about 500 to within two, two three weeks, it jumped to 700. It, uh, some people are saying the post post uh, primary election uh, of political parties, uh, yes. is there more to, to, to it? It's a combination of mm. reasons. Um, and politics has something mm. to do with it. Because we know that there's a lot of political bribery that goes on in this country mm. and goes on in dollars you mm. know so there is a scooping up of mm. dollars always actually around the election periods you know this is one factor mm. uh, but there are other factors nigeria is not producing oil at its proper quota mm. and exporting it so even the revenues it is earning mm. are, are, are very misly you know um and for the first time we now saw that the earnings of the first quarter mm. have been outstripped by uh, what we are spending in debt servicing. So we are now use, paying back debt more than what we are earning. When your country is at that position, mm -hmm. it is in trouble. Because... What, what level of trouble? Serious trouble. Is it up to uh, Afghanistan and uh, Venezuela level? Is it what incremental uh, policies could deal with? Well, you see, <laughs> for, for us to be able to deal with this problem, again, I come back to the nature of the political leadership and the government in power. You know, if you look at a number of decisions that are being made, for example, the oil subsidy, mm -hmm. the petrol subsidy continues, you're spending four trillion uh, subsidizing half of it a fraud, or more than that, a fraud. But you're not spending anywhere near that on health care and education. ASU is on strike, and you are not able to pay them what has been agreed. So that means it's not as important to you as other things. Whereas, that should be the most important thing. Mm. The educational system which brings up young people in this country should be the most important thing on the minds of any government. Because it is the educational system that determines whether the country can make progress or not. So, the wrong priorities you always see. Then you say you're having a social uh, intervention program. But to me, that is just recycling poverty. Because if you don't fix the education system, you're not going to be able to fix the ability of young people to have the skills that they need to either have jobs or create jobs for themselves using innovation and entrepreneurship. So should we have deployed that money into of a social intervention into education system improving? Mm -hmm. Well, I believe there's a different approach. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I were the man on the seat, I had proposed when I was uh, an aspirant and mm -hmm. when I was a candidate in 20. 2019, that Nigeria should set up a one trillion naira venture capital fund. Mm -hmm. That fund will finance innovation. It will finance young people mm -hmm. to start businesses, and it will finance them with equity capital. That is ownership mm -hmm. capital, not credit that they have to pay back. Because we all know that the credit system in this country is broken. Mm -hmm. Interest rates are so high that most people are not able to pay back loans or even to access them in the first place. So you shift to a different model of finance, which is equity, that the venture capital fund, which in my own vision, should be managed by the private sector. Anything that the government manages is turned into a rent-seeking enterprise. This is the experience we have in this country today. Many, a lot of fraud mm -hmm. will, will be carried out, and there will be no accountability, because politicians are seeking to use whatever the government sets up for pay it, You think that corruption, the private sector is insulated from it, that it won't I creep in? Is it not the same society the private sector is operating uh, alongside the public sector? Yes, but the private sector has a profit motive. And therefore, they're accountable. If they don't manage what they have well, they'll go out of business. And that is an incentive to try to perform. That is the point. That's mm -hmm. the fundamental difference between the private sector and the government. The government in Nigeria does not feel accountable yeah. because the citizens are not educated and they're not empowered. So the government feels they don't owe them. You see a lot of our politicians, big politicians, yeah. reluctant to submit themselves to presidential debates, reluctant to submit themselves to um, interviews because they believe that the citizens, their structures will deliver the votes and they don't have to come and explain to you, you know, um, 
you know, what, what they plan to do or how they plan to do it. So you find that accountability is inflicted only by the market. And that's why the private sector tends to be uh, somewhat more efficient. So that's the point that I'm trying to make. But the point, you see, we have to also go back to very foundational issues. When you're talking about the Nigerian economy, what is the economic philosophy of the Nigerian economy? I think state? we'll come to that later. Absolutely. Yes. Let, 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 let's interrogate yeah. this issue, this issue of corruption and whether the um, private sector is insulated. You mentioned the subsidy regime. Yes. Combination of private businessmen. Yes. Um, in and distributing uh, petroleum exactly. products and government making the payments. Exactly. And you acknowledge that more than half of what Amanda goes into it is fraud. Absolutely. And it takes two to can. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you have the public and the private sector involved. Yes. You're right. Mm -hmm. You are right. The private sector, uh, to the extent they deal with government um, economic machinery, yes, there may be a lot of corruption, like in the oil subsidy mm -hmm. uh, situation. Clearly a lot of corruption. But I was saying that if you have a normal private sector company you see mm -hmm. just doing business normally it has to survive by being profitable and it has to survive by being efficient and effective in its business model so i'm, I'm not saying the private sector is insulated they are part of the problem part mm -hmm. of the problem in fact we also have bad governance in this mm -hmm. country is that the private sector mm -hmm. does not hold politicians accountable for making the um, economic environment good for business instead a lot of the members of the private sector go into cahoots with politicians for their own individual benefit we will get a waiver uh, you know the, the machinery will be set up that my business will prosper and so you find that those private sector players are part of the rent seeking mm -hmm. that is going on in the economy so the private sector has its own share of blame so the private sector has to first rediscover itself the reinvent private itself. sector must first reinvent itself it is a government economy in this country and very few businesses are, are able to operate without um you know getting favors from the government that's not a real free market economy and this was is leading me to the matter of the economic philosophy, mm. which I'm anxious about. Yes, to. Uh, there's want. no way we we'll avoid that. Exactly. Uh, because that's the foundation. It's the foundation. So let's go for a break now. When we come yeah. back, we we'll have going deep into the issues. Do stay with us. Did you know that AIT social media handles have all changed? If you are one of the millions of our followers on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, this is introducing to you AIT's new official and rebranded social media handles. Like or follow us now on our Facebook page, Official AIT Live. If you're on Twitter, switch to our new handle at Official AIT Live and activate the notification button to get breaking news and updates on the go. For exclusive short videos and photo news, follow our Instagram account at Official AIT Live. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Official AIT Live, and enjoy live streaming of news and your favorite programs where you can also watch our broadcast materials at your own convenience. Note that Official AIT Live is the only authentic social media profile name with all the handles on our website, AIT.live, with a notification prompt to accept and receive breaking news and updates on the go. Log on to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube platforms on your smartphone, tablet device, laptop, and desktop to follow us now. AIT.live on air, online, online. Thank you so much for staying with us, Professor Kingsley Moral is still with us. I will have set the duration for the second stage after evaluating political uh, and but more of economic and security challenges Nigeria is facing. And we concluded that we need to go to the foundations, the philosophy, he says, and that's what we set out to do now. Of course, just before then, you maybe link to that, uh, the issue of... Uh, the corruption deep embedded in our e economics and political system. It's, uh, uh, you said uh, it's there, but we need to uproot it. We must. Uh, how do we begin to uproot it? Because the issue of subsidy, the current president described it as a fraud while he was out of government. Uh, for decades, we have been managing this fraud. Yeah. How do we stop managing this fraud by destroying this fraud? 
the, the mm. first way to manage or to destroy mm. this fraud and corruption mm. is for government to get out of the market. The government has no business setting the price of petrol and subsidizing it, supposedly. If the government feels that if there is no subsidy, the price of petrol will be very expensive for poor people. If they bring out 500 billion naira, not mm -hmm. 4 trillion, not 5 mm -hmm. trillion, they, working with that state, will spend on subsidy. Yes, with state governments, they can set up a transportation system for the masses, not those who are rich, who are the, who don't need that mass subsidy. Oriented transportation. Mass oriented transportation systems, waterways, railway, uh, road, whatever. You know, that takes off a certain category of people. It's a fraction of what they spend on petroleum subsidy. And you can then invest the rest of that petroleum subsidy money in the things that can actually take this country forward. Development, mm -hmm. education, healthcare. I keep coming back to those two things. Mm -hmm. Our young people must begin to have innovative and creative skills. But for that to happen, you must invest. Because the unemployment problem in this country begins from the educational system because the educational system is not wired it's not aligned to teach young people the practical vocational skills with which they can use to create jobs for themselves if they have those skills and then you have this venture capital fund that i was speaking about where they can get investments equity investments from the fund and the fund part part owns their business and if they don't run that business well the capital will not come you know they're responsible but if they run it well, and after some years, they pay off the, venture cap, uh, the capital, venture capital company, and the business is their own completely. So this is the way to go. And even there, you must still put in a lot of um, procedures because Nigerians have just become wired. Some people, immediately you set up a fund, a wolf money, don't come, in their own view. Their fair share. Their fair share. Mm. They, go, they go for it get the money and will not use it for so the accountability system in this country also needs to be beefed up people need to go to prison and when people see other people going to prison for frauds and all of that then it becomes a check there's nowhere in the world that people are good the only difference between this country and america or switzerland or japan or south korea is that in south korea we saw the former president convicted for corruption <laughs> we saw it would that happen in this country so that tells you that the rule of law in this country is weak. And when I talk about, when you talk about the, uh, how do we get out of this country? So first, we get the government out of a lot of these processes. Because if they go with the market, look at the telecommunications industry. It's far much better today, far more productive, far more efficient than when we were under the era of NITEL, where you had to go and bribe people in NITEL to be able to get a phone line. Do you see the point I'm making? So, but today it's a free market, free entry, free exit. There are several telecommunications companies. That's what we should do. That, that the they will implement this is yes. very necessary. That's now, the point. Now, look at NMPC. Yes. Commercialize. Some say we should have privatized. I have. Uh, I, I called in 2019, mm. 2018, in fact, I think, uh, for the privatization mm. of the NMPC. Commercialization of the NMPC is not enough. So long as the government mm. is the owner of that company. Um, I don't think that company can meet its potential. It has to be privatized. But when it's being privatized, mm -hmm. you have to do it very carefully. Otherwise, the same vested interests mm -hmm. will just bite up and it doesn't really benefit mm -hmm. Nigeria. Like we saw with the discos. Like we saw with the discos. Yes, exactly. So it's the political economy of mm -hmm. this country. It's a rentier political economy and it's geared towards vested interests. Is it that the commercialization of the NMPC is the first step towards privatization because the problem is that uh, by 2023, mid 2023, they begin to sell equity shares to members of the public. Well, that's what they say. Um, you know, so we'll have to watch and see how that goes. We also hope that the Angotez refinery will be in, in, in operation um, before the end of next year. I think that will also help a lot. It will not affect the price of of petrol because it's set up in an economic um you know an free trade zone, uh, free trade zone. Mm. so it, it's, been, it's an international commodity. It's an international commodity mm. on foreign territory technically mm -hmm. you know but it will affect the availability of of petrol 
And so, and you know, at least reduce freight charges and all those. Exactly, things. exactly. And then, right. you know, petrol queues and all of that. Hopefully, we'll, we'll stop that. So, the NMPC needs to be privatized, not just commercialized. Um, and that's a process, again, that I said requires very careful supervision to make the, sure it serves the, the interests of Nigeria. The Aramco's of this world, yes. the petrol, the brass, were they fully privatized? Some said largely. Some, some form of government control, yet we are seeing large, I, when I say uh, some good instance of uh, success. When I, when I say privatization, I mean at the very least, mm. it, there should be a 51% to 49% ownership structure between the government and the private sector. I would say the private sector has 51 percent the government can retain 49 percent like the lng the liquefied mm. natural gas company there's not ownership on it but it runs well and it's mm. profitable that's because it's driven mainly by the private mm. sector the venture capital fund i'm talking about it's the same model mm. that the government should be an investor but not run it the private sector should run it and so everybody benefits you see that's what i mean but once something is completely owned by the government or significantly owned by the government in this country mm. It's not going to be. It will be interesting to see how LNG and to monitor. Because I see uh, NMPC now as a, a profit-oriented uh, company. And for me, uh, the best way to adjust the performance of management is the profit day. Exactly. Uh, the money they pay into the federation account. But uh, payments into the federation account by LNG. Uh, the house one being about two billion dollars or so. so. So it will be interesting to see LNG paying, yeah. NMPC paying at the end yeah. of their financial year, yeah. and we see yeah. uh, valid performance. Exactly, exactly. So I mean, commercialization is a step in the right direction, but I just feel it's not enough. I, I feel that we need to remove complete government ownership of the NMPC. Yeah, it, it's just you know for too long, fifty years or whatever. This company has just been there. It's not been able to really make any profit, and it's just a cesspit of corruption. This is the problem. The government is too heavily involved in the economy. And once that is the case, mm. the economy can never prosper. Because the government itself, as we know it in our political mm. culture, is not disciplined enough. The Chinese, for example, they run what they call a state capitalist economy, where the government has many government companies, mm. but there are also many, many private sector mm. companies. But you see, there's discipline, mm. there's philosophy, there's political will. There's a worldview. There's, a, there's somewhere they're going, and it's clear to them. And everybody who is part of the political process, and even the civil service and the bureaucracy, is equipped. In Singapore, they pay their civil service more than the private sector. And most people who are important in the Singapore public service have PhDs, so that you can think analytically. <laughs> are we doing that in Nigeria? Well, it's just that um, the issue of... Uh, Abacha called it guided deregulation. Yes. Uh, the state uh, intervening, but uh, to an extent, you mentioned the issue of the China situation where uh, firms, public firms, are run profitably. Like we see exactly. the, the big companies from China, the CC, ECCs, and many of them, yeah, they are publicly owned companies. Absolutely. So, how, how do we get that mix? The problem is this mm -hmm. you know, the way is this. The, the, if you go back to China, China's politics, mm -hmm. China's leadership is based on a philosophical foundation. There is a world view, there is a, a national ambition that is shared across the whole ecosystem. You don't have that in Nigeria. So the kind of political leadership you, we elect in this country going forward mm. is foundational to whether we can make progress along these paths. If we continue to elect just people who are quote unquote successful politicians, <laughs> then you know you will continue to get the same result if we break away from that system and elect people who have ideas people who have capacity who demonstrated capacity who have a vision for this country and can lay it out and can mobilize on the basis of 21st century mm. thinking then we have a chance at success so but you come back to the question Will the elections actually hold? Yes. Uh, 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 in the midst of security and economic exactly. challenges. In the, uh, in the midst of this security and economic meltdown. Mm. I saw the other day, uh, yesterday, a statement by a British diplomat raising the possibility mm. that if this situation continues, the elections may not hold. And, you know, diplomats tend to speak from very informed perspectives. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they may have information that most citizens of the country itself will not have. You know, so 
there's a grave threat to Nigeria's democracy posed by this combination of the security and economic. If there is overrun Abuja, for some reason, do you think there can be any election in this country? If they capture the federal capital territory, it's all over. That's it. There is a grand plan to overrun this country by terrorism. And that will bring Nigeria to the state of Afghanistan. The question is, is the Nigerian state today able to resist this? We pretend to be living a life of normalcy while all of this is going on. People are doing business in Lagos and all that. And you might think life is normal. What if they attack Lagos? There are reports that they've been denied, but we've seen security agencies uh, raise the alert level even in Lagos. Exactly. Mm. So there is risk management. Mm. We have to manage the risks that are existential that face us as a country. And I have, I have proposed some clear ways to do it. I have said it is clear that our security agencies right now are not able to contain these people. We should seek foreign help. Specifically, we should recruit mercenaries, private armies, to pay them. If you, if you look at what you're spending on subsidy and your country is being overrun by terrorists, if you took out a percentage of that and paid, paid a, 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 a mercenary force, and give them the charge to go into the forest and take these guys out. They will do it because they fight for money. Right? It's for a temporary period. They do it. Then you have the space to reorganize mm. the security forces. Because it is clear that parts of those security forces have been compromised by corruption, for example. Mm. We have reports that there are people who don't want this war on terror to end. Mm. Because they're making money from it. Mm. You know? So, so all... For whatever reason, some people may be aligned with some of these terrorist forces. Even former so, President Jonathan said there, are, there were Boko Haram elements then. In his government. In his government. That was 10 years ago. Yes. So it, it tells you a lot. So it tells you a lot. Quickly yeah. to our Twitter feed, Carlos Clement says, uh, your workman Nigerians respect a, a lot, a great deal, uh, but you don't seem to uh, ha have the uh, platform to uh, exhibit your dreams and is asking whether you're obedient. If not, he wants you to become obedient. <laughs> and then Tom says he's wondering why the system uh, hates persons uh, like Professor Moyalu. Uh, he exudes uh, knowledge and ability to deliver. But why is it not uh, stable by remaining in one political party? Okay. Uh, Mango and Waza says. Uh, he doesn't know how this government uh, has assembled the best economic brains as presidential economic advisory committee and seem not to take advice because of scoundrels around them. Mm. Interesting. Um, well, there are several comments that mm. are raised there. The first is thank you very much uh, to the gentleman uh, who spoke to the respect that one does command uh, across the country. That's very kind of you. Mm. But you see, whether or not people like me emerge in the political leadership of this country is a function of the citizen's will. Mm. Many people will understand what people like us are saying, agree with it, but when they act politically, you see that they are still enslaved to traditional politics. People are legitimate in their eyes politically only when they come from the PDP or the APC. If you, are, if you have not been a member of those parties, they will not, you know, support you at the level at which they should. Mm. So, the citizens... There has the belief that it's the parties, it is the parties with the structures. That's the belief, you mm. see, but that's the point. It's the, it's the mental emancipation that still has to take place. What is a structure? A structure is human beings organized in a very clear way. It may be traditional, like the APC and the PDP, or it may be a different type of, of, uh, of, uh, of structure. I mean, for example, we talked about the obedience, you know, the, the people who are supporting uh, Peter Obi and all that. I mean, that's also a welcome intervention in the politics and, and takes off from where people like us, who began mm -hmm. this movement, to get the young people involved in Nigerian politics um, and to have a voice. So it's good that these things are, are coming up 
to challenge the traditional system. And it's up to the citizens. You know, elections are, uh, 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 you know, it's a matter of choice. You know, you, you, yeah. you're quite right. You yes. started this. You of built course. up strong followership on the social Absolutely. media. Absolutely. And, and on the ground. Yes, I must say. yes on the ground. But yeah. why, why do you think you didn't take it to that next yes. level where it becomes yes. a nation that has an international team? Yes, exactly. What do you think went wrong? Well, I think, I think what happened is precisely what I was telling you. That our citizens still worship traditional politics and mm -hmm. traditional politicians. And when, even when they respect you and like you, mm -hmm. they may not have enough faith that you can win. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So they don't... Meanwhile, they're getting increasingly tired. But, you know, in every situation, there is always a time and place for everything. Some people are builders. Some of us built mm -hmm. and started. Now, it seems to be taken off even more than, you know, that, so that's a good thing. But you also also have to consider that there are many vested interests. Nigerian politics is a politics of money. The delegates in this, the problem in Nigeria's democracy starts with the delegates. The delegates are there most of the time for money. And once they are given the kind of money they are looking for, they will vote for the people who gave them that money, whether or not those are the best kind of people to lead Nigeria. That is not their concern. You know? And we see it everywhere. We see it everywhere. In the big parties uh, I, I and in the small parties. Yeah. It's the same okay. thing. Even in the small parties? Even in the small parties. Many of the small parties mm. are trading posts. Mm. They're there as hustlers. They're just there looking for who will give them the most money to survive. So it's a business enterprise for them. Or they're just there making noise until APC and PDP co opt them into some sort of alliance. You have a lot of, I'm not saying all of them, mm. but many of them are in this mindset. They're just political entrepreneurship outposts. So this is what I have come to realize. And this is, of course, part of why, you know, we had uh, the, the outcome we had in, uh, in, in, in the primary where I participated. The ABC, yeah. Yes, absolutely. So you find these things everywhere. Mm. You know, and it is up to you as a person of principle mm. to decide whether you want to condone this type of thing mm. and be part of it, or whether you simply want to say, I clean my shoes to, to uh, what uh, yes, I want. Did yeah. money play a role in the primaries of the ADC? Well, I, I really don't want to go back to mm. the primaries of the ADC. Mm. For me, that is just, uh, you know, it's just a blip on but the screen. Yesterday determines tomorrow. Well, well, yes, but I have left the APC, ADC, so mm. I don't want to continue to comment on the ADC. I'm talking about Nigeria, mm. and I'm talking about the future of Nigeria. Mm. And that's where I want to um, have the discussion, not on some individual. Let bygone yeah. be bygone. No, no, no. I don't waste my time on those things. Okay. Yeah. Now, you spoke of the delegates uh, being induced. And a Dwayne or Shun and Ekiti election, we saw high rate of vote buying. Yeah. And some have said because of uh, the new electoral act and its provisions, the, the, elect the voter has now become key. And we may see uh, in large magnitude voter inducement during the general election. Yes, it's becoming more difficult to rig the election mm -hmm. directly in terms of how the ballot is counted or calculated. With the new electoral act, mm -hmm. it's going to be tough. So the sh it's shifting now to vote buying. Now, I want you to know something. Nigeria's democracy is evolving. Even in the advanced countries, at some point, there was vote buying mm. in their system too. You know, let's also understand this. Mm -hmm. But we don't have the luxury of spending 200 years of vote buying. You can learn from what other countries have gone through and short circuit your own rise as a nation. This is what the Asian countries have done. Mm -hmm. They were also colonized like, like Nigeria. But they are not waiting for 200 years. They are immediately jumping to challenge their colonizers by developing their economy, by having strong political leadership based on strong philosophy. You know, I keep coming back to this matter of the world view, which is, who am I in the world? Where am I coming from? Where am I going? How will I get to where I'm going? What is the value system that guides me? What is the strategy on the basis of which I'm moving forward? What is the knowledge system with which... which through which I absorb truth mm. and claim truth. This applies not just to individuals, but to countries and societies 
at large. Uh, and in, in the Nigerian situation, yes, uh, you mentioned the linkages between the fellowship and the type of leaders we get. Exactly. And we have an education system that is defective. Defective. Uh, through Brits, not work class citizens. No. And these affect their mindset, their own perception. Exactly. So it becomes a vicious circle. They vicious. take that into elections yes. and politics. Exactly. So, so the point is, one, our educational systems. I gave the convocation lecture last week at uh, Babcock University um, in uh, Elishan Remo in Ogun State. Chief Obasanjo was there also as uh, the special guest of honor. And it was a very interesting time. I spoke on knowledge, vision, passion, and innovation in the context of Nigeria's development. And I was saying that there is no way a country can develop without these four things. Without knowledge, a lot of our decision makers in Nigeria today do not have knowledge. How can people who don't have knowledge take a society forward? Many of them don't have vision. Therefore, there is no passion for the country. And our economy is not driven by innovation. Every economy that is doing very well in the world today is driven by the invention or adaptation of new things. In the, tw in the 21st century. In the 21st century. So it's a knowledge economy where it is skill that goes into producing complex products with value added in them and exporting them. That's how you end Forex. That's what Nigeria should be doing. We have the potential to do that. But we need to create a social consensus and a strategic priority on innovation and science and technology. I said at the lecture that in the, Biaf in the Nigeria Biafra Civil War, mm. the Biafrans, for the short-lived period of the Republic of Biafra, Necessity became the mother of invention. They were inventing all sorts of things. Obunigwe, Ojuku bucket, bombs, um, running uh, petrol uh, with coconut uh, water and pet mm. coconut oil, you know, running their cars because of the blockades. You see? So, but after the Civil War, it would have been good if those scientists were brought together and said, this country is back together mm. as one country. Can you, that thing you were doing in the Civil War, do it for Nigeria. Today, Nigeria would have been um, very far ahead. So it's about, so if someone who believes in this innovation and scientific and technological advance is the president. I also spoke about something that is very important for Nigeria's political economy, and that is constitutional restructuring. There's too much power and authority in the federal government. Mm. And this feeds the rent-seeking culture of Nigeria's political economy. If you devolve powers down to the states or the regions mm. through a constitutional restructuring and create what we call popularly resource control, mm. the federal government has no business owning natural resources in a true federal system. The resources should belong to mm. the states or the regions mm. where they're found. However, because those states and regions mm. are part of Nigeria, mm of the revenues from those resources must also go to the federal government to run the federal system. That was what we had during That's the first uh, the first republic. The first republic. Uh, exactly. Uh, about 50 percent? It was 50 50. Yeah, 50 percent. Today I would recommend about maybe 60 40. Okay. Yeah. The, the last uh, tweet we are going to read is sounding philosophical. Maybe you address it in one minute. Thank you. It says, You're much respected, sir. The truth of the matter is this in Nigeria, uh, our political understanding and political actions are. A direct opposite of each other political understanding on one point and political actions on another part he says well the reason um, political actions are different from political understanding for two reasons uh, one is poverty poverty is a reality in Nigeria today mass poverty in fact many of the politicians want you to remain poor Mm. So that when the election comes for every four years, they will come and give you 5K. Mm. And you will think you have won a lot. Mm. And you go and vote for an incompetent or corrupt person. Mm. So that is, that is number one. Poverty is, is a fact of life. Number two is that mental emancipation has not re yet taken mm. place. So even though... Thank you so much for your patience to watch from the beginning to the end. I hope you have learned something from the video you have just watched. The video you have just watched is to bring information to your doorstep and for educational purpose. It is not to demonize anybody. Let us watch continuously and see who can be able to make a sense out of every nonsense we are seeing. We must continue. We move. It doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter what they say. They will kill us. We will kill them. 
at the end of the day, Biafra is here. Thank you for watching. If you have not subscribed to the channel, please kindly subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell so that you're notified each time I upload a video. You will be among the first to receive it. Thank you and remember us. Bye-bye. See you again.